getting towards my favourite time of the year because it's commercial silverfish season. And anywhere from November right through to March and April, commercials like Allcroft Fishery, where we are today, in fact, most of them up and down the country offer some amazing silverfish sport. There's a lot of silverfish specific matches, but even on carp matches, you can build up quite a big weight in the quiet times during the day by targeting the commercial silvers. And today I'm gonna to show you a three pronged attack with three different swims, all fed a little bit differently, but all do their own job to get the best from this sort of venue. The first thing a lot of people ask when it comes to starting a session on this kind of fishing is where the hell do you actually start? Where do you plumb up? What sort of areas do you actually target fishing? And for me, there's three key ones and they all have a different sort of job to do. I have an area of my swim where I want to start the session, one where I progress to in the middle of the day and one where hopefully I'll have a good finish. So to kick off, I always tend to start out of the way, either left or right. Today I've chosen to fish at an angle of about 11 o'clock and that particular swim I'll feed very negative with just a few pellets to start with. I've got some micras, I like today I'm yellow with a little bit of yellow pineapple dye, just something a little bit different because you've got to use fishery pellets here. But I'll feed a tiny little amount at the start there and just start fishing there with a four mil expander. And the reason I feed so little to start with there is I just want to catch any fish that are in the area. And sometimes, especially when it's cold in the winter, if you're piling a load of bait, you can catch really well over it later, but fish are very shy and wary of it at the start. So I always feed one spot to start with, with a little bit of bait, just to get you off the mark. Now, the second spot that I choose to fish is what I'd like to call my main line of attack. That's where I expect to build most of my weight and get bites through the majority of the session or the match. And that's normally straight in front of me, if plumbing up allow is a nice area and enables you to do that. And there, I feed a mediocre amount of bait, what I'd like to class as a medium amount, something like three balls of ground bait. And in that, not too many particles because I want to be in control of the peg. So today I've kicked off with three one-handed balls, squows quite softly. So a bit of cloud comes off them, the ground bait works and it doesn't sink into any silt on the bottom. So three balls with a pinch of joker in, great little bait to put in your balls for silverfish if the fishery allows it. A pinch of maggots and a pinch of caster. So not a lot of bait at all, I can always put it in there but I can't take it out. And that is my line for catching for most of the day. Now, the final line is the big finish swim. And I always like to give myself a chance of catching some big fish on a lot of fish late in the day. In a match, if you've not done well in the winter, it's always good to have somewhere where you've got a chance of coming back by catching some better fish. And on a lot of these fisheries, and it, it, again, it's sort of similar up and down the country. I've been to a lot of venues like this over the years the short line is deadly for it. Fish have got quite um, ritual habits and big fish like bream, big perch, they'll come in close later in the day to feed on bait that anglers throw in. So I always feed a close in line at the bottom of the first shelf, quite positive. And today I've put in six big balls of my ground bait mix. It's got quite a lot of joker in and a very big handful of casters, probably about 200 mil a casters at the start and I've laid that bed down a lot of bait because it's going to be there for probably three hours before I go on it I want to create a big area so fish can come in get confident and graze on it so three different swims one negative to start one mediocre for the middle bit that's going to be where I'm going to spend most of the time and then I've given myself a chance of catching some big ones and a lot of them late on that close line three pronged attack hopefully it's going to pay off so after feeding just a little sort of, I don't know how I can describe it, a little palm full of micros to start with, probably about 100 pellets. I'm gonna actually kick off on this swim. I've got a small little pot on with a sprinkle lid, and I'm just gonna sprinkle in sort of half a pot of micro pellets, some little yellow specials I've done. Oh, got a bit of a twig on the hook there, branching out. I'm gonna sprinkle them in, um, just to keep a little bit, bit of bait going in and hopefully draw a few in at a time. Now, something that's really important with pellets, especially when you've got a little pot on the end of your pole, is to be accurate. So, far bank marker, something that you've picked, sprinkle them in 
in one spot and then pay a lot of attention and put a lot of effort into getting your rig bang over that little pot of pellets. There's no point potting them in in one spot and fishing six inches to the left or right. You want to literally set a little trap so your pellet is right amongst them. Got a four mil yellow expander on there. And I'm hoping we'll get a few bites early on on this one. Good thing about starting on this negative line with just a little bit of bait is you get a good reading of what your session's going to pan out like and generally when it's cold if you get off to a good start on this the other swims will kick in quite quickly whereas if it's slow on this line you don't get many bites to start with you can expect things to be a little bit slower overall and there's a few little tricks for putting fish in the net sometimes putting a maggot on the hook instead of a pellet on this line will show you that there's a few silverfish there, roach, perch. But if it's going to be a good day, you'll normally go in and catch some skimmers on an expander pretty quick. And today, it's not great, to be honest. We had a bit of an hard frost overnight. It's calm, cold, clear. And no bite so far tells me it's going to be a little bit tricky. So maybe we're going to have to wait a little bit longer for the other lines to kick in as well. First fish on the old pellet line. Took longer than I thought it would. Don't even know if it's a skimmer. No, it's, not, it's a nice roach. Now that tells me straight away, probably not gonna be that much of a skimmer day. Or if we're gonna catch some bigger skimmers of bream, it's probably gonna be late on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a red maggot on over pellets and just see what other fish are actually out there feeding to start with because a bit of a tricky start to be honest. I thought it'd be better than that to begin with. And if we do catch a few more roach and not any bream or skimmers, I'll be quicker to move on to the other line. So again, I'm just using this one as a bit of a guide to see what's there, see what's feeding and hopefully it'll help me make some better decisions later on. There we are, another one. There's obviously a few fish just come in. It'd be interesting to see what this is because I put a red maggot on that tie. Look at that. That is a massive Tommy Ruff. That's, that's got to be a British record, that, isn't it? Look at that. It's a great dinosaur. Imagine if they grew to about eight pound, how cool they'd be. Ooh, be scared if you walk up next to that. But again, not a skimmer or anything. That's beauty of just slipping a maggot on. It just sort of shows you what else is there. We'd have never caught that on a pellet. Another little fish on the uh, pellet line with a maggot on the hook. What is it? Perch. So I get like that's three fish that really didn't really expect or want to catch on that. So we might only be like 15, 20 minutes in, but already I'm thinking that's not great. Slow start, and I'm gonna have a look on the other line. Just got a feeling that a bit more ground bait there, that softballs activity. Might have pulled the fish to that area today where it'd been a little bit calm and cold. So let's see if they are on that main line yet. Single red maggot to start with.
that straight away. I haven't even got me, uh, I haven't even got my pole in my spray barrel. I'm just fiddling about with it. Literally a bite immediately, a nice roach. And fish like that, obviously they've come straight to that ground bait. They're eating that little bit of joker that's in it. Lovely little weight builders early on in a session. If I can catch one of them every chuck in for the first part, if it were a match, I'd be very happy. Try and get my pole rest set up now. <laughs> I had a feeling there'd be a few more fish over that ground bait line after that slow start on pellets. There certainly seems to be. Lovely chunky little roach them. There seems to have been over the last few years I don't know if, it, if I'm right saying it or not, but a lot of people frown at using a gentleman's rest or a spray bar, a front rest, whatever you want to call it. But for this sort of fishing where you're holding a bait still and you want to be nice and accurate, I absolutely love them. If there's a bit of wind, you can keep your rig extra stable. I can line my float up with my marker, my pole stays in the same spot and my rig settled bang on top of that baited area. And in winter, if you need to make a few balls up or play around with your bait you can do it as well so for me wallop look at that for me the spray bar is i'd be lost without it to be honest this time of year i absolutely love them better presentation a little bit of freedom definitely catches you a few more fishes at this time of year you often get them misty cold still mornings and that's what it were like this morning and as soon as that sun sort of burnt through we've definitely started having a few bites it's something you can be quite wary of this time of year like temperature rises half a degree or a degree when it gets to sort of an hour or two into the session it can be a right trigger for fish suddenly starting to feed and we had that slow start on pellets but it's literally one every drop in over the ground bait and it's probably a combination of the fact that they want to feed over that ground bait today i've put some joker in there and the roach rather than skimmers at the minute but it could also be because that sun's popped through temperature's gone up a little bit brighter and just triggered a few more to feed that's interesting another big fish and it just shows what we talked about earlier as in that start on pellets was so slow that it took a good hour and a bit to start catching anything decent gotta watch that tree there when we top it but when it comes to commercial silverfish don't get much better than that look a roach every chuck in for nearly an hour and then an arrival of the old flat lads single red maggot still doing the trick and amazingly no roach all of a sudden so these fellas obviously bully them out of the way Ooh, another flat lad they're there now, aren't they, them boys? Amazing how they just turn up on this sort of venue, innit? They've obviously been sat in that lake after that cold night. Roach have come in. And now these bad boys are like, mm, I want a bit of that food as well. Big fish, worth a lot of roach. One of these bigger bream. Ooh. 
I love this sort of fishing I do. You could probably hear that ice cream van. We are up north and it, as you know, it's a little bit strange up here. So that's why you can hear that ice cream van in the background in the middle of November. Cracking. You can probably see it has gone a little bit quiet now. It's been brilliant, to be honest. I can't complain. I've gone in, caught them roach on this main line, had a really good run of big skimmers, but it's pretty obvious to me now that they've eaten most of the bait that's there. It's slowed down. I've caught a few tiny roach. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to top up the swim and put some more bait in. And the beauty of the spray bar, like I say, you can get this ready while your rig's actually still in the water. And what I'm going to feed with is a one-handed ball, similar to what I put in at the start, but it's going to have a little bit more bait in it because I want to keep this line going for probably another hour or so before I come short. So I'm going to get a big handful of joker. This is some frozen stuff I've actually had in the freezer from last year. So a big handful of joker gone in the mix there. I don't think it matters if it's dead. In fact, sometimes I think bream actually prefer it. And I'm going to put a few maggots and a few casters in and just make a one-handed ball up. I'm just mixing it in there now. I'm just going to make a big one-handed ball up that's got quite a lot of bait in, and hopefully that there will keep this swim going until I need to come in on that close line. And after I've fed this ball, I'm also going to start throwing a few casters onto that shorter line because it's getting towards that time of day now when I'm thinking about moving on to it. So I've got that ball ready. Fact, I reckon I've got a bite out there as well. Oh no, missed it. So time to top up, sneak him in, start throwing some casters short, and hopefully that'll keep me catching till the end of the session. I've got to be honest, I don't believe there's any secret baits or secret recipes when it comes to ground bait and pellets and additives and things like that for this style of fishing. But what is important is you use a ground bait that's right in the sense it's not too fish mealy when the water goes cold, but you still need that element of fish meal in it because these places are fished with pellets and strong fishy ground baits all summer and the silverfish definitely develop a taste for it. And my mix reflects that. There's loads of ground baits out there that do the job, but this is the one that I'm most confident in. This is my mix. And it's a combination of two parts, sweet marine, which is quite a dark, sweet fish meal ground bait. It's a lovely color, loads of hemp and mazy particles in it, but some real good quality crushed pellets and fish meals as well. So I go two parts of that. Today I've done two pints of that. And then I go one part, it's green supreme. And this is a little bit of a fishy smell to it, but it's not too powerful. And it just gives it a lovely natural greeny color. So a dark sweet marine with a little bit of green as well. It's absolutely beautiful. And when it goes really cold, sort of Christmas time onwards, or whenever we've had, whenever we've had any really hard frost, I'll actually pass it through a pinky riddle as well while it's dry just to take out them extra big lumps because in it as you can see here if I just riddle a little bit off you can see there's quite a few big bits and you'd never want to feed the reason that ground bait is so good because it's full of rich content like that but when it goes freezing cold I always just like to riddle them great big bits off so you're left with a nice fine mix so another little tip for you there as well um, how it's actually mixed, I think, is very important. Whatever ground bait you choose to use, whatever you're confident in, I'd advise you mix it this way for commercial silvers, and that's to get as much water in as you possibly can without making it stodgy. And I do that. I get up in the morning, and first thing I do is I have my ground bait in a bucket ready to go from the night before, give it a good whisk up with a bit of water, and then leave it to stand. Then I'll load my van up, and just before I put my ground bait in my van, I'll add a little bit more water, give it a whisk, and then when I actually get to my peg, it's absorbed even more, and it'll need a little bit more water adding before you use it. So I actually add water in three stages, and the reason for that is I want all them particles, all them pellet particles, maize, bits of crushed hemp that's in it, 
to soak up as much water as possible to make sure all the ground bait stays on the bottom. It's nice and inert and it lays there. The last thing I want is it fizzing and popping in winter. I don't think that's right for fish like skimmers. I don't think they settle over it comfortably. So two or three things that are really important with ground bait. Nice dark colour, not too fish mealy, but definitely an element of fish meal and a little bit of finesse by riddling out the big bits when you get a chance. And of course, I should have said four things really. Get as much water in it as you possibly can. Mix it up in two or three stages. Um, the next thing that I do to tweak my bait a little bit when it comes to pellets, I love yellow as a colour, especially here at Allcroft because people use an awful lot of corn here throughout the summer and I think the skimmers are quite tuned into it. So I just use normal four mil natural expanders and I put a little squirt of the pineapple captivate on them. You need a tiny bit. I could dye my hair with this stuff. It's that powerful, the orange one. Um, little tiny blob of that on my expanders and they go a lovely yellow colour, which I think just a little bit different to other people's bait. Gives me a lot of confidence. And I do exactly the same with the fishery pellets. Tiny little blob in them and it just gives them a lovely yellowy edge. And when you put them in ground bait, I don't know if you can see there, if you are putting a few micros in your ground bait, they just stand out lovely, nice glowing. Again, for me, it's a little bit of a confidence thing just to know that my bait is a little bit different and smells a bit different, looks a bit different to everyone else's. And that's it, really. Nice and simple, but everything done for a reason. You've probably heard a commercial silverfish rig trap from me before, but quick refresher and run through. There's not a lot different to what you'd probably expect. Um, all three of my rigs today have got a six inch up length, 010 pure fluorocarbon and an 18 F1 pellet. I use that hook length and hook combination for 99% of commercial silverfish work all the way through for the year. And here at Allcroft, carp counters are pound in silverfish matches. You can even land them on it as well. But what is different is the float pattern and the shotting patterns for the three different swims. And there's a good reason for that as well. So I'll talk through that. The first one being the pellet rig where stability is absolute key. I want to pot them pellets in and hold my rig nice and still on top of them. So starting from the elastic, I've got a number six slip, a little bit pingy because with a pellet, you're only lifting into bites. So you want something a little bit heavier just to pull your hook through your pellet into the fish. Main line's 013 engage and coming down to the flow, I've mentioned before, I've got a number eight back shot about six inch above it just to hold it nice and stable. It's not actually shot in the flow. It's just to balance on the top of the water to hold it in place. Float itself, half a gram, um, a wire pinger. And the reason I use that is because it's got quite a thick hollow bristle and light in the winter months, especially early on in the day when you're gonna be fishing pellets, when that sun's low, it's dead tricky. I'm ginger and I wear glasses, actually contact lenses, because it wouldn't be cool if I had glasses as well. So I struggle to see floats that are too fine. Nice, thick, hollow plastic bristle, dotted to an absolute pimple, so you can see it. And that wire stem, lovely and stable. Down the rig, don't get any simpler. I've got a bulk about 35 centimetres from my hook length loop of number nine shot. A few 13 micro cubes that I use just to dot that float down above the bulk. And then two number 10 droppers and that 010, six inch hook length and 18 F1 pellet that I spoke about. And bulk gets it down the droppers just kick in nice and slow hopefully giving a fish chance to see it and that is the pellet rig set just over dead depth so on the bottom nice and simple but hopefully you can see there's a reason for that rig being how it is now the next one is the rig for my main line the one where i'm spending most of my time fishing over the top of ground bait and the elastic here is a little bit softer I've gone for a number five slip, and the reason for that is I'm more likely to be catching some roach and smaller fish on that swim, so I don't want to bump them off. Um, in winter, it also encourages me to net more fish, because I sometimes get a bit excited, try and swing them, and it doesn't always go to plan. So a nice soft elastic, you can catch pretty much everything on it. Same 013 engage main line, but the flow is a little bit heavier. It's a 4B18 one of the prototypes from our new natural range, which is coming um, in 2022. And it, again, it's all about stability with this flow. It's quite long, so even when it's windy, it'll sit nice. It's got a thick wire stem, again, stability. And then it's got sort of medium fiberglass bristle that is very, very sensitive. Um, 
skimmers in particular, little ones in winter, give you the most delicate bites, just like with pellets, and a fish with that dotted down and pick up at pretty much any indication on it, to be honest. So nice stable float, but also a little bit heavier so I can nail it still on that spray bar. Now, shotting wise, it's all about stability again, and it's a little bit different to the pellet one. I've got my bulk a little bit higher up because I think there's more chance of catching fish as your bait's falling in with baits like maggots, casters, even bloodworm. So I've got my bulk 42 centimetres from my up length loop. I've got it there because I once had a really good day at that distance and I've just set it at that ever since. And then I've got a taper of shot below that bulk. The bulk's nines and then I've got six number tens getting further and further apart as I go towards the up length loop. And that's a pattern Will Raisin showed me a few years ago. Used it ever since, caught loads of fish on it and I'm super confident and then that same six inch hook length that I've already talked about. But that line of shot, because there's so much lead on it, it nails the bait nice and static, which I think is important for skimmers, but it also gives it a nice slow fall so you get that chance of one seeing it. And then the close rig is different again because I'm fishing for bigger fish here late in the session and I'm gonna be throwing in some casters as well, loose feeding, so there's gonna be bait falling through the water and the presentation this rig offers reflects that. Same number five elastic, so I don't get too encouraged to swing things, nice and soft. The floats a four by 14 version, the same as the rig for the main line in terms of shape and bristle, but I've gone for a carbon stemmed version, just so that rig falls in nice and slow and the float follows my rigging um, where I'm gonna be loose feeding them casters. And that is because the shotting pattern itself is a simple taper so i've got six or seven number tens on there all getting closer together up to about a quarter of the way up the rig the deeper it is the further up i'll have the last shot coming to but it's about five and a half foot today so the last shot's about two and a half foot from the hook something like that and that just gets the bait down but that last bit falls in lovely and slow and it's amazing with these bigger skimmers and bream on this kind of venue they're dead crafty, they've been in here for years, and when you're trying to catch them late on on that close line, just having that slow falling bait really does catch you an odd extra fish. Hang on to your flow as it's cocking round, and just as that's bait settling, you'll get a big dink and wallop, and that light rig tailored towards that kind of presentation, loose feeding, really does work. So three different rigs, three totally different jobs for three different times a day, and just like the ground bait, each one of them's got a specific reason to be used. There we go. Did seem to unsettle them a little bit topping up. I probably fed a little bit too much bait in that ball because I missed a couple of bites and bumped a fish, but 10 or 15 minutes later, seems to have settled down and the skimmery bobs are back. So I'm hoping that we can enjoy another good run of fish after topping up with that ball, bit of joker in it, them few casters and maggots. Hopefully that'll keep me going for another good spell now. And like I mentioned before, I've started throwing 15 or 20 casters onto that short line because that is where we're going to have a big finish. Now that we're catching a few uh, skimmers on this line, I definitely think they're going to come there late on. I might have shot myself in the foot saying that, live on camera, but I'm pretty confident we will catch a few short now. Another one. They've definitely settled on that top up now, which just shows it's all about timing with that kind of thing. If you top up too early, you'll end up with too much bait in your peg, but if you don't feed when it needs feeding, you'll not keep catching. And there's no hard and fast rules as to when that actually is. In fact, it's frustrating when people say to you, when do you know when to top up? Because there's not an answer. It's different every single time you go, but these tell you when you need to do it. So generally for me, longer periods without a buy or a sudden change in the fish you're catching. If you're catching skimmers like that quite regular, and all of a sudden you wait for a bite and it's a small perch, a tommy rough, you get a little run of roach and you think, hmm, why aren't them skimmers still there? Probably that is the sign you're looking for to refeed. So no hard and fast rules. Let the fish tell you when you need to top up.
But it's been a nice uh, run of fish on that long line after topping up. Definitely worked. And if it was a competition today, I'd be absolutely buzzing with how it's gone. But I've just got a feeling, because it's been so good out there, that we might enjoy a good little spell just to finish on that short line. Light's dropping, a bit of clouds covers come in and we've not got that long left, but I've been throwing some casters there. I put all that bait there at the start. I talked about feeding more there because you're gonna leave it so long. So it's time to have a cheeky look, I reckon. That's the right rig. I'm gonna start with a single caster as opposed to maggot, just cause that's what I've been feeding there. I feel like them bigger fish do prefer casters and it's late in the day. They've had enough free offerings from me now. So I feel like it's uh, get your own back time on them, hopefully. I'm not actually gonna feed till I hook a fish because I don't want them coming up off the bottom for the loose feed. So if I do hook one, I'll throw a few casters straight after so by the time I get back out there, till they're all settled on the bottom. Just seem to reduce foul hookers and liners that way. There we go, we've hooked him. Throw a few casters. And that way them casters will be on the bottom by the time I get back out there. And as expected, if you have a look at these, this, this is where them big ones live. This is where they come in. Look at them. Big old dark bream. They're older than Adam Rooney, they are. And that's old. They've been in here some years, they have. Proper old, all croft warriors. Look at him. And you can see that took, took literally seconds to catch him. But that's because that line's been fed at the start, left alone. Or should I say fed at the start with a right amount of bait, left alone, and then we've just primed it with a few casters before we've gone on it, and straight away they're there and lined up. And even if you save it till that last half an hour, you can still put quite a big percentage of your weight in the net in that very last bit. You might have noticed that bite that we had then as well came just after the rig had settled. And that's what I talked about in the rig chat. That lighter flow on this close line just allows your bait to fall in, lovely and slow. You can see it fall and you often catch them just as it's settling or just after it's settled on the bottom. This is sometimes what happens on this close line, folks. You get an odd one of them mixed in. Now, at Allcroft, and in the matches here, these actually count as a pound, so it's worth actually getting them out. And they do turn up on that close line with them big bream as well. Unfortunately, he's about 10 pound, but I'm only gonna get a pound for him in a competition. But what is nice, it shows you how confident you can be in the gear using 013 mainline and 010 fluorocarbon up length and that 18 hook. You can get them out no problem at all if you take your time. There we go. Another large brazim I reckon he is on the short line. I love catching these late on. It just sort of sums up your day. If you get it right with them three swims that I've spoke about, pellets to start off with, that main line out in the lake in the middle bit and then finish off by, hey, oh, hooks come out in net. Finish off by catching them short. You can have a lovely day. Don't always got a plan. It's been perfect today, but generally stick to them three things, three different ways of feeding, three different rigs and get your timings right, moving between the three lines and you can have a lovely day catching some commercial silvers. And if you've enjoyed the video as much as I've enjoyed doing it, it's a winner. I bet this is a massive tench. For you that are watching, I'm going to call it early. It's not a carp, it's a tench. There's only one in here and I reckon I've got him on.
You know, like when they just bang, they just bang their heads. Funny. And I reckon that's what he did. I'm telling you, this is him. Oh no, it's just a big bream. <laughs> what you got to say about that then? He was pulling, wasn't he, for a bream? You've had your Weetabix this morning, mate.